Good afternoon. I'm Charles Shapiro, President of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Our program today is a conversation with German Ambassador to the United States, Emily Haber. The topic, of course, Germany's role in Europe. Today's program is sponsored in part by the German American Cultural Foundation of Georgia and is co-hosted by our friends at the American Council on Germany. I wanna give a special welcome to Dr. Heike Fuller, the Consul General of Germany in the Southeastern US. Former Bundesbank President Ernst Weltke, Josef Tomasevich, Chair of the German American Cultural Foundation of Georgia, Greg Lesser, CEO of the Pendleton Group, Steve Sokol, CEO of the American Council on Germany. And I got one friend, Don Daniel, I wanna give a shout out to. We have been friends since 1962 and he's joining us from Boston. Emily Margareta Haber will celebrate her third anniversary as German ambassador to the United States in June. Prior to this assignment, she served in various leadership functions at the German Foreign Office in Berlin. In 2009, she was political director and in 2011, state secretary of the foreign office, the first woman to hold either post. She was seconded by the foreign office to the federal ministry of interior, the German equivalent of the Department of Homeland Security, where she served as state secretary in charge of homeland security and migration policy from 2014 to 2018. This was in the midst of the refugee crisis where Germany received 1.3 million refugees in two years. Ambassador Haber is an expert on Russia and the former Soviet Union. She's held various postings at the German embassy in Moscow, as well as working on Russia from the foreign office in Berlin. She holds a PhD in history. And when we last spoke, she corrected me on an error I made in American history. So Ricky, you need to be careful what you say. Our interviewer today is Ricky Bevington, senior anchor and correspondent at GPB Radio and host of All Things Considered. Ricky is a 2020 French American Foundation young leader, a 2014 German Marshall Fund fellow. She traveled through the Ukraine during the 2019 presidential elections, and she serves on the board of the Georgia Council for International Visitors. Uh, has Ambassador Shapiro frozen, or am I is it, am I frozen? Um. I don't see. I it. believe he has frozen. We're having a few technical difficulties. <laughs> My apologies. No worries at all. I think he had just wrapped up my bio, so I am happy to um, get started. If, if Val, we'll wait for your instructions, whatever you prefer. Yes. Feel free to go ahead. Okay. Thank you. And if he wants to rejoin us, we'll we'll pause and let him finish his remarks. How about that? Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the World Affairs Council of Atlanta for including me in today's event. Uh, I never say no to an opportunity to engage in international dialogue and bridge building. And it's a huge honor to be asked, of course, to talk to uh, the German ambassador, especially at this time. I mean, at all times, um, and speaking with an ambassador is important, but I think all of us can agree that these days, every issue just feels like the stakes keeps getting, keep getting ratcheted up. In fact, we already have a Q&A question about Nord Stream 2, which of course is on my list. So we have over 200 people, I believe, joining us today. I know all of you have great questions. So I'm going to open this up. I'm gonna have a range of questions that are gonna range from policy walk to leadership, to gender, to race and of course points in between. And this is really to inspire the audience to feel free to ask the ambassador the questions that, that are on your mind as well. So knowing my audience, I will simply begin, Ambassador Hubbard, can you simply share with, with us with the pandemic, what is life like today in Germany for, for people dealing with the pandemic? Right. Uh, we are in a better place right now uh, than we used to be a, a couple of months ago. Uh, the uh, federal states have, uh, are in a process to slowly uh, open again, uh, um, but still many work from home. Uh, children uh, go to school only 
part-time uh, kindergartens or childcare facilities uh, have not all uh, reopened as yet. Uh, the overall situation though is, uh, is getting better. The vaccine process is underway about 40% of uh, the German population has received the first vaccine, 14% uh, 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 both vaccines. And you will remember that our vaccination uh, efforts uh, uh, really um, got uh, gained traction uh, only fairly late. So we're in a better place right now, uh, but it comes with a context. And the context is uh, in the early days of the pandemic, uh, we handled the situation fairly well because we were affected later than other countries. So we had, uh, uh, space to prepare uh, the ICU in the uh, units, we had a pandemic strategy in place. But after um, the end of the first lock, uh, lockdown early uh, uh, last summer, people sort of dropped their caution, people traveled, uh, and this in conjunction with the um, with the second wave and new variants uh, produced a new surge of the pandemic and a new lockdown uh, at the tail end of which we are right now. So we see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but caution still uh, needs to be observed. And as here, uh, people are very keen and eager uh, to get out uh, and uh, to resume their normal lives. Are you seeing the same kind of vaccine hesitancy in Germany that we're seeing in the United States? And if either, regardless of your answer, what would be, what would explain that? There is vaccine hesitancy and we've seen uh, during the pandemic, a, a surge of uh, fringe discussions uh, on uh, reasons uh, uh, why you shouldn't uh, get yourself uh, vaccinated, uh, but overall, uh, um, I believe that the number of those who are ready to get themselves vaccinated is actually climbing. It's now at 74% uh, of uh, Germans say they want to get themselves vaccinated and only 15% uh, 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 refuse to get themselves uh, vaccinated. The numbers were lower uh, uh, or respectively higher uh, a couple of months ago. They were 65% versus 90%. So there is hesitancy, but it's in decline, and uh, there's overall a uh, uh, strong readiness uh, uh, to um, well, use the vaccine in order to uh, go back to previous lives. To our normal lives. Well, here in Georgia, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention data last week showed that 70% of the state's vaccine supply had thus far not been used. Oh. It's not quite an apples to apples comparison to a poll on public sentiment, but just to provide context for here in Georgia, there's a lot more vaccine than there is demand. And speaking of vaccine supply, you mentioned a late um, rollout, a shaky rollout in Germany, which had very much to do with uh, European Union uh, issues. So I guess, you know, has this, has the pandemic, how has the pandemic impacted Germans' attitudes toward the EU in general? Uh, that's an interesting question. And actually uh, it comes, uh, it requires two answers. Okay. Um, the first answer is uh, in the early days of the pandemic, um, every European country was very inward looking and tried to take care of their own. Um, which meant uh, that they declined to export uh, uh, urgently needed uh, equipment, mask or whatever uh, to other European countries. But you know, uh, that really brought us uh, to the edge of the abyss because the European Union is all about actually um, helping and supporting other members uh, when they're not uh, capable to support themselves. It, it revolves around the principle of solidarity. So. Um, questioning the uh, uh, solidarity principle by actually not doing what is expected uh, uh, has the potential to undermine uh, um, the European rationale. So that's when we, looking into the abyss, uh, when we completely reconsidered, and you will remember uh, that not only exports uh, restarted, but also a, a recovery package uh, was put into place. And with for the first time in, in European history, a one-time mutualization of debt. Um, the commission is now able to raise money on financial markets and it is being uh, um, handed out to European member uh, countries who will only have to pay back uh, in the ratio uh, of their uh, 
of the relative um, uh, participation in the, uh, the budget in the uh, overall context of the European uh, budget. So that's completely new and it reflects to what extent uh, the pandemic after first uh, fits and start had uh, reinforced the principle of being responsible for other members of the European Union. Um, now let's move to the uh, vaccination effort a moment. Um, it gained traction only fairly, uh, fairly late. Um, and I do see two reasons for that. The first one was uh, that apparently last summer, when everything should have been concentrated uh, on uh, setting up uh, um, an institutional um, and procedural uh, setup for um, for vaccination process, this didn't happen because no one expected uh, the vaccine uh, to be um, produced or invented uh, as quickly uh, as, as it then was. The second uh, step, uh, um, or the second uh, thing that is relevant uh, for the delay was uh, that yes, first uh, a number of European countries among which Germany, four European countries all in all, um, decided to take over the effort uh, for um, uh, procuring uh, and buying, purchasing uh, vaccines. Um, that would have meant that only a couple of European countries uh, would have benefited uh, from uh, the procurement efforts, whereas smaller countries, uh, which by dint of their size uh, or economic weight, would not have been equally uh, capable of uh, um, of uh, instrumentalizing the market power in order to purchase uh, um, vaccines at uh, acceptable prices. This was the rationale why we decided, no, can't be individual European countries because the bigger ones will be better off than the smaller ones. And here again, the principle of solidarity and responsibility for the entirety of the European Union prevailed. Uh, and that's where the European Union stepped in. This was during the German presidency of the uh, uh, European Union. And the European Union can sometimes be a slow tanker, and it focused on market prices. Um, my sense is that here and in other countries like, uh, uh, like the UK and Israel, um, they viewed the pandemic as a challenge to national security, whereas the European Union uh, acted uh, or um, acted as if this was um, handling um, a market problem. And that is relevant for the delay. Now, the third reason, uh, which is also important and often uh, overlooked here, um, one of the reasons why we uh, were pretty late uh, 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 in uh, sort of getting uh, people um, uh, or getting vaccines to people was that actually half of the production of European vaccines, um, and we're talking about 200 million doses uh, was being exported to other countries, 90 all in all. So at no time as the European Union uh, said, uh, well, we'll first sort of get our people vaccinated uh, and we'll think about the responsibility uh, of poorer and affected countries uh, at a later stage, this we didn't do. But obviously that also meant uh, uh, that fewer um, vaccines were uh, at uh, the disposal for European member states. So that's more or less uh, the mix of reasons uh, that were um, that were responsible uh, for a slow start, which uh, is by now history. We've caught up now with countries uh, that were more successful in the beginning. At the end of the day, though, we can understand why people, when a pan global pandemic arrives in your neighborhood, you you want to just immediately take care of your own. Yeah. And people are driven by fear. And so they may look at how it was handled and say, but what about us? Okay, we saw that in the United States, certainly plenty. So my, I guess my question is the, the principle of solidarity is obviously the government's view, but what are German voters saying? Are they as on board with this principle of, on, is, of solidarity as today versus 15 months ago before this pandemic arrived at our doorstep? What's your gauge on that? Well, um, it is a point. Uh, I would say that overall, especially in the first phase uh, of the pandemic, people have rallied around the government. Um, and that is, in spite of the criticism of the early days of getting vaccines to people, is still, uh, is still true. 
um, uh, the uh, um, substantial majority of the people, and we're talking 60 to 70 percent, was uh, um, uh, was an agreement uh, with what happened. Uh, I'm not saying uh, that there wasn't uh, um, strong criticism at details uh, and relevant details uh, of the uh, bureaucratic processes, uh, um, but there was not a major uh, pushback or a major uh, uh, discontent uh, uh, with it. And then again, you see Germany, at least, is one of the most globalized countries in the world. We know exactly uh, that it's impossible to solve, uh, to solve national problems first and then look at the rest. It's not possible in Europe, not given uh, the fact uh, that we live in open borders, at least in the Schengen area, and the pandemic can travel as quickly uh, uh, as we've seen uh, it did. So um, we knew from the beginning uh, that uh, to just take care of Germans wouldn't solve the problem. We have to take care, all of us, all Europeans, uh, of uh, European uh, citizens. But then as long as borders are open and uh, European citizens travel, uh, uh, we can't afford uh, just to um, eclipse uh, the, um, the role uh, and uh, um, the relevance of the pandemic worldwide. And then I might um, say, Add to, say, uh, add to that an observation, uh, which is probably not a, an imminent or immediate uh, um, reflection among uh, people. But in the longer run, um, the degree in which uh, Europeans and Americans, for that matter, have come to the support uh, and help uh, of those in need, uh, of those countries which have been most affected by the pandemic, uh, uh, will determine um, the normative clout uh, that we have. And I'm talking about democracies and their capacity to deliver and to display uh, responsibility for what is happening uh, in neighborhoods, but also in places far away, because they're pretty close in the globalized world. The reason that I was digging a little bit deeper about kind of the, the pulse of German citizens and voters right now is because Germany is and I can ask you about this, but we can just say the de facto leader of Europe, what happens in Germany often have, you know, leads the rest of the way. And two main issues are, are Germany is at the center of right now in Europe. One of them is Nord Stream 2, of course, and the other is really the environmental movement. And so where how these two issues play out in Germany and how they're debated and the attitudes of the German public will very much domino throughout Europe and the rest of the world. So let's start with Nord Stream 2. Um, we have a question from Elizabeth Pond who says, what has happened to common sense in the Nord Stream 2 spat? Why not just enforce EU energy rules, strictly use reverse flow pipelines to Central Europe, including Ukraine, take advantage of fungible gas and pump whatever financial aid is needed to keep Ukraine's economy growing during the green transition period. And we will talk about the green transition period after this. Okay, but uh, if you permit me, no German would say that we are, uh, that we are a leader of Europe. We are uh, one of the biggest and economically, uh, certainly the strongest uh, country in Europe uh, for the moment at least. Uh, but we know exactly uh, that, um, um, that we need consensus uh, with major players in Europe in order to uh, which think on many issues completely differently than we do. Uh, but if we want solutions and if we want uh, to produce, a, um, uh, to produce a, a consensus, well, uh, then we'll, we'll have to reach out. One of the reasons why uh, Germany and France are uh, uh, often going ahead is because we think so differently on so many issues. And if we sort of uh, bridge uh, a gap, uh, then it's relevant for the rest of Europe because they uh, they share um, uh, the differences, you see. So, but having said that, let's return to Nord Stream. Uh, I don't think that the person who actually asked the question uh, will expect me uh, to disagree uh, what he or she uh, uh, said, because I agree. Um, the, uh, let's start with the uh, uh, European uh, law. Uh, Nord Stream is a project that is legitimate uh, under and legal under European law. And the EU uh, regulation adopted back in, I think it was September 2019, uh, is actually uh, with its unbundling uh, approach, uh, means the application of European law. Second, reverse flow. 
Um, I always thought myself that the argument in the past had been legitimate to say uh, um, the Russia has in the past uh, weaponized uh, gas exports uh, for political gains or used gas in order to uh, coerce uh, um, uh, political uh, reactions. This is this was possible as long as reverse flow uh, uh, wasn't possible. Uh, but the experiences uh, in um, at least after uh, 2011 made us uh, reconceive, reshape our pipeline system. And nowadays you can uh, you can pump gas into any direction, north, south, east, west, which means that energy security isn't defined anymore by where the gas comes from, uh, but whether you can replace the provider. So that weapon uh, uh, has lost its, uh, that specific uh, uh, weapon has lost its, uh, its relevant relevance. We have also um, been instrumental uh, in um, in achieving the trilateral agreement between the uh, EU Commission, uh, Russia, uh, and the Ukraine uh, on transit uh, of gas uh, uh, gas via uh, the Ukraine, uh, um, which was another uh, uh, which uh, was another factor uh, that would uh, um, uh, mitigate uh, the potential. Uh, uh, latitude uh, that Russia would have uh, with regard to uh, Ukraine. And I totally agree uh, in, um, in an overall approach, uh, uh, gas needs to uh, play um, a reduced role in the longer run. We're looking at hydrogen, we're looking at uh, renewable energies. Uh, uh, and um, as you said, uh, as the, the person who, uh, who asked the question said, uh, um, we'll have to look at what we can uh, within the uh, uh, Ukrainian energy system, how uh, we can make modern and renewable energies uh, a factor of, uh, of resilience for Ukraine. Thank you for your answer and for that great question. And I'm sure that it will come up again in the Q&A and, and invite the audience to put your questions here in the Q&A section. And we'll get to that in about 10 minutes. Um, you know, something I'm just fascinated and all of us have been fascinated to watch the, the rise of really the environmental movement and the Green Party in, in domestic German politics. Why, why is this happening in Germany? T tackling climate change, voter sentiment toward uh, environmental changes. Why is that gaining momentum in Germany? Well, the Green Party in, uh, in Germany has a long history of over 40 years uh, uh, 40 years now. So uh, I think the uh, one of the observations uh, that uh, are in place is uh, they come with a long history and they've been in government uh, uh, before, both in on the federal level and on state level. Second, um, there is a general consensus uh, in, in Germany about the relevance uh, of climate change uh, and uh, the potential of climate change for actually da daily lives of citizens, something you see here in the United States as well. And in addition to that, we have a very strong um, youth movement, millennials and younger ones, uh, um, the uh, uh, Climate Fridays uh, demonstrations, and they're very powerful. And when the uh, German government uh, adopted uh, a climate package and adopted uh, a climate law, which would have meant uh, that compared to the 1990 levels, uh, um, fossils would be reduced by 55% by the year 2030, and that uh, um, uh, coal-fired uh, energy production, energy generation uh, would end by uh, at the latest 2038 and would be fossil fuel by 2050. They took it to the Constitutional Court. And the Co Constitutional Court decided uh, in its ruling uh, that uh, this um, uh, uh, this set of steps would, was not sufficient, and it wasn't uh, reflecting something the court called uh, um, uh, generational uh, justice. So it um, uh, ruled uh, that actually uh, there needed to uh, the, the the pace uh, of uh, steps needed to be. Uh, um, accelerated, and so now we're in a different place. We'll have to reduce. We'll have to be. Uh, uh, we'll have to reduce by 65% uh, um, fossil uh, energies uh, 
by the year 2030, so that's a plus of 10%. And we have to be fossil fuel free, uh, um, that is uh, net emission zero uh, uh, by 2045. So that shows you that from different uh, paths uh, and vantage points of the society, there's a strong push uh, uh, for being ambitious in, in uh, climate policies. And the concept of general, gen, the legal concept of generational justice is absolutely fascinating. And I invite the World Affairs Council of Atlanta to do an entire panel on it and compare ideas of that in the United States, incredibly controversial, but also compelling. And I know many European, uh, many Europeans are having a conversation about that ruling. It's, it's really, anyway, it opened my eyes to a lot of, a lot of new ideas. Um, Moving on, we've just got a couple of minutes before I officially open it up to, um, to Q&A. So I wanna actually talk about women in leadership and I wanna talk about uh, Belarus as well. So um, let's just, I wanna just ask you um, two of the most powerful women in world politics are German. And I was wondering if you would be willing to share your experience uh, as a woman in international affairs and as a German, and of course, the context of this is what happened in Turkey with Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, as uh, many women in certainly in international affairs were watching that um, as a moment for us all to reflect on. So I invite you to share your experience and your thoughts on that. You mentioned uh, two women leaders. Um, I think the yardstick uh, for uh, assessing progress uh, in uh, women in international politics are not women leaders. They're role models, uh, obviously, uh, and they're telling uh, generations of young girls uh, that they can actually do it. And it's not the stuff the boys do. So it's important in so far, but I've always uh, made it a measure of success to look at the number of women in middle management, because if they move from middle management to leadership positions uh, in bureaucracies or in, uh, business environments, you'll have to choose, you'll, you'll have to be able to choose among several women as you have to be able to choose uh, among several uh, men. And if there's just one woman, a woman or none and several men, something's not right, right? So don't only look at the uh, top positions. Um, on um, the general observation uh, you made, uh, how are women treated? I myself have witnessed, it didn't happen to me, but it happened to another woman uh, um, during uh, in negotiations. I will not say which negotiations. Uh, and I saw men scrambling to the table uh, in order to have a seat on the table and not sit in the second row where she landed, even though she was more important than they were. And that was an eye opening, uh, an uh, eye opener for me. And, and obviously uh, uh, when I saw, uh, um, the scene uh, that you have mentioned, I thought of that. I think in general, um, there's, I, I see at least if you've arrived at leadership positions, you don't see a, a much a discrimination anymore. But what you do see is that men, if they don't know uh, uh, that say the ambassador or a business leader is a woman, they will assume that the men in their environment, in her environment will be the leaders. So it's, not, uh, there's no um, discrimination intent, uh, but the way uh, positions, leadership positions are framed are still very much determined by uh, um, the, this is the stuff the boys do thinking. But that's not, uh, it's not discriminatory. It's just the old um, frameworks. Uh, the, the way of framing uh, come from a time uh, that is not ours anymore. Well, I think some in our argument, our audience would argue that frameworks are discriminatory and that's the conversation about systemic racism, particularly yeah. and sexism that we're having certainly in the United States and hopefully elsewhere. You mentioned- oh, but may, I say, may I just come in? Uh, I think they are. Um, I was just saying the intent, gotcha. Uh, gotcha. the intent uh, of the person and his or her awareness in that moment is not discriminatory. You mentioned women in middle management, and certainly in order for women to make it to the very top, they've got to come through the pipeline. 
today the Council on Foreign Relations is actually launching their um, diversity and international affairs conference. It's a two day conversation about the pipeline of international affairs being more open and diverse. What is the German government doing to make sure not just women, but everybody feels included to be part of the pipeline of serving their nation and other nations in uh, international affairs? Yeah, and that's a, that's a very important point to make. Uh, when I entered the um, Foreign Service, uh, this was in 1982, uh, um, I was a member of a crew. Uh, there were 30 all in all. There were 27 men, um, obviously all white and none was a migration background and three women white and none was a, a migration uh, background. If I look at the crews today in the uh, foreign ministry, um, that's different. It's a completely different story. Certainly, uh, I'd say half of the uh, crews are now uh, women. Uh, and we have uh, very strong networks uh, in the uh, foreign ministry, uh, um, uh, networks, rainbow networks, the network, uh, uh, diversity networks, uh, um, and the uh, diplomats of color uh, network, and they're pushing. Uh, it's like the millennials in the or the the, uh, the the young people in Germany pushing for climate change. These persons are, are, um, from the diversity networks are pushing for change too, and their uh, intention is that by two thousand, I think twenty four, so uh, forty percent uh, of uh, the positions will be. Uh, um, will reflect the diversity of our uh, society because no way uh, that we could have today uh, a crew of 30 with 27 white young men and three white young women. So there is change. Uh, and to some extent, uh, by the way, uh, the uh, demonstrations we've seen uh, in the wake of the George Floyd uh, uh, murder, uh, uh, demonstrations happened in Germany too. Uh, and for the first time, uh, it, it, it's, they spilled over uh, and they brought home uh, to people uh, that this is not, uh, these are not developments far away uh, that actually we have issues to confront as well, our colonial history, for example, or the specific history of discrimination uh, against uh, colored people or against uh, people with uh, a background in uh, migration. So there's a lot to do, but I do see a change underway too. We have a question about Belarus and all uh, from, from somebody in the audience. And I, I just wanna say as a journalist, this is uh, really personal to me to imagine being on a flight in Europe and to be yanked off that flight and arrested because a government doesn't like something that I've said or written. Um, I think everybody who's watching right now has a stake in the values of liberal democracy. If I would ask everybody to just tick off why you care about this. For me, it's as a woman. For me, it's as a journalist. And, and you all have your reasons as well. So the question that has been framed by an audience member is what is the US and UN role in the rising autocratic leadership in Belarus? Well, the uh, European Union uh, yesterday uh, or the day before yesterday actually, uh, took a number of steps. They charged the Council of Ministers to uh, produce uh, um, a legal basis uh, that would allow us uh, to ban uh, incoming flights, uh, um, uh, uh, flight over, um, uh, uh, over flights uh, uh, across Belarus, uh, over flights uh, or incoming flights from Belarus to the European Union. So that's a first, uh, that's a first step. It will probably take a week and, uh, until it is put into or transformed into uh, uh, actual uh, legislation, which will then trigger uh, national legislation. So that's a first step. Uh, we're also going to expand uh, sanction uh, uh, that are already in place uh, against the leadership. But you see, that is necessary. It's part of a necessary uh, language uh, and sanctions and embargoes uh, always are. But do we actually change his behavior? My sense is, and I'm saying that from someone who's watching it from afar, <clears throat> my sense is uh, that uh, Lukashenko wanted us to know that he can do it. And not only us, uh, Americans and Europeans and others, uh, he wanted actually um, dissidents abroad knowing uh, that he can do it. It's a bit like the Tiergarten murder or the Salisbury. It's the message that uh, 
we can get you anywhere. And that seems to be uh, uh, the backdrop. And if that's the case, uh, let's not um, uh, exaggerate or overstate uh, uh, our capacity uh, to alter the behavior by punitive measures. That we, uh, we need to take measures, but uh, we have to be very patient uh, and um, uh, take the um, take the long view uh, on actually bringing uh, um, bringing change uh, and freedom to uh, to Belarus. This is also about Russia. Mm. So, uh, in the words of a of a friend and advisor who works in this space, we were talking about Belarus. We were talking about Nord Stream Two. His his question was simply. What more does Russia have to do to show us that we need to rethink our relationship? Well, I, I'm not quite sure uh, where this is headed, but uh, I can only say this. Uh, Russia is a neighbor uh, of European countries. Uh, it's a, a huge neighbor, and we can't simply ignore uh, or eclipse uh, uh, this fact. We'll have to deal with Russia uh, on a number of issues, uh, including issues where they may be at the source of the problem, uh, but uh, we'll not be able to solve the problems without uh, them. Now, um, international relations are not uh, a bonus uh, for good behavior. We have international relations and diplomatic ties because we actually are confronted with differences uh, or problems uh, or challenges uh, where in some cases uh, we'll be needing Russia. So um, just a policy of uh, Punishing Russia uh, out of the international landscape will probably give it more latitude uh, in its uh, in uh, its outrageous uh, um, policies and strategies, uh, including um, violating uh, international uh, international law, uh, human rights uh, uh, infringements, and so forth. Uh, um, you. I know that this uh, may not sound uh, uh, may, uh, may not sound um, morally satisfactory, uh, but the truth is, uh, um, in some cases, you need to put a punitive price tag to behaviors, and in some cases, we'll be needing Russia. We'll be needing Russia when we deal with uh, Ukraine. We'll be needing Russia when we deal with Syria. Uh, we'll be needing Russia uh, in the Security Council. Uh, that doesn't mean we give in to uh, um, uh, into policies that are unacceptable. But just ignoring it uh, or saying uh, uh, the punitive attack can be the only one uh, doesn't get it. We'll need Russia for arms control. Uh, uh, that's why the administration concluded uh, the uh, um, the extension of New Start. Uh, all these things wouldn't be possible uh, if there wouldn't be an avenue of engagement beside uh, the punitive and sanction tracks as well. Thank you for that answer. And it sounds like based on what uh, Biden spokesperson Jen Psaki said yesterday about why Putin and Russia will be meeting, it, you're very much aligned with the Biden administration on that. And I have so many, so many follow-up questions to your answer, but I want to make sure to honor our Q&A. Um, I have just to sort of make sure that we're covering a lot of different topics. Edward Charter asks, can you describe what Germany has been doing to address anti-Semitism post-World War II? Um, a center stage is uh, education. Um, the, um, well, no, I should say there's there are different tracks, but education is center stage uh, and teaching about the Holocaust uh, um, uh, is obligatory in all uh, German schools, uh, um, not only in, uh, in history, but also in, uh, um, in subjects like uh, uh, religion, uh, um, sociology, and so forth. It happens in uh, the um, uh, secondary, in, uh, in the um, second tier of the secondary and the third tier of the secondary uh, education. And obligatory, obligatory in every single German school. Um, second, uh, we have uh, um, we have a commissioner uh, on the federal level uh, for combating anti-Semitism uh, anti and protecting uh, Jewish life. And meanwhile, uh, this doesn't only exist on the um, federal level, uh, every single German uh, federal state uh, has, um, um, has installed uh, a commissioner in its uh, own uh, government. 
And the uh, third uh, step, um, uh, the third track is obviously uh, uh, if uh, anti Semitism occurs and uh, prevention has failed, uh, then uh, we'll uh, go after the instances with the full force uh, of, our, uh, with, uh, of our laws and obviously uh, protection uh, of Jewish life uh, and uh, protection of Jews in Germany uh, uh, is part of that uh, approach as well. Um, we've played uh, and we've played for a long time and we've been the chair actually of the, uh, um, of the Holocaust, uh, um, uh, Holocaust education um, uh, what is it called, association until March uh, this year, uh, where uh, we have expanded uh, the uh, definition of um, uh, the era, the, uh, where we have expanded the definition of uh, anti-Semitism, where we are, um, uh, where we are uh, lobbying and undertaking many efforts uh, to extend and expand the number of countries who've accepted uh, uh, the definition because combating um, um, anti-Semitism is not something that can only happen locally uh, or nationally. Um, in uh, our communication societies where uh, even hatred uh, travels uh, incredibly fast, uh, we need to uh, work in alignment with as many countries as we possibly can. And it's an issue that's an issue that actually keeps coming up here in Georgia. Um, it's in the headlines today. So, um, I will, uh, I will say actually, for, for those who are interested, the Bremen Museum here in Atlanta is, this week is having a program actually tomorrow about um, descendants of Holocaust survivors being able to learn and do research. So there's an effort um, to help keep just really people in Georgia sort of plug into history and collect artifacts. So uh, it's, an, it's an activity very much happening in Atlanta today that's very relevant. I, there's a question here that I think actually encapsulates a lot of the questions I'm seeing thematically. So I'll, I'll put this to you and then we'll wrap up. Um, how does our rapid hour in the United States, rapid reversal of Trump administration policies combined with the deeply divided electorate affect your attitude about whether the US can be trusted to live up to its commitments for longer than four years? Um. It is true that, um, that a change came in the bilateral relationship, and I'm not only talking about Germany, I'm talking about uh, the European Union too, uh, when uh, the Biden administration decided uh, to return to international treaties, to return to international organizations, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to uh, pursue a different, uh, a different view of uh, the role of allies and alliances and not to see anymore the world as an arena where everyone uh, is pitted uh, against uh, um, uh, another uh, adversary. So we're back in, um, in working hand in glove. Uh, in, uh, we're back to alignments. We're back to uh, um, uh, coordinating and cooperating uh, closely. Um, but I should also say, uh, um, when you mentioned America is back, uh, for Europeans, it hasn't been gone. Uh, yes, the approach was transactionalist, uh, and the uh, uh, view uh, on, of the uh, of Europeans and of allies uh, uh, was a very skeptical one. But uh, throughout the past four years, uh, the United States has also been instrumental in. Uh, um, in providing security for Europeans uh, as well. So it's not a complete, uh, um, uh, this was not a complete, uh, how shall I say it, uh, a lack of hiatus uh, uh, between uh, what, uh, what was five years ago and now. Um, to the other question, can that happen again? Well, obviously uh, in democracies, uh, change is possible. Uh, and the conclusion uh, uh, Europeans uh, and I as a German would take uh, is the Trump years uh, have probably brought home something which remains relevant uh, um, for uh, in this new administration uh, as well. And that is uh, we need to do more on burden sharing. European, uh, um, given the uh, given the change of the international balance and 
given the focus uh, of the United States on what is happening in Asia and in China, uh, it would be hugely important uh, that while working um, as closely as we possibly can with the United States, uh, we take over it, we shoulder a more responsibility uh, ourselves. That's not because uh, we would be uh, um, we would be pulling into a different direction. It is just indicative of uh, Europeans and the European Union and what we can do security-wise as European countries needs to be an asset uh, of our uh, collective uh, approach. So that's probably one of the lessons uh, of uh, the years of the uh, Trump administration. Uh, more responsibility and more um, um, uh, burden uh, shouldering uh, by, European, uh, by Europeans, uh, thereby um, uh, thereby um, uh, adding to our resilience, uh, economy and security wise, and being a strategic asset uh, whenever uh, we confront uh, um, uh, a challenge uh, collectively. Ambassador Haber, you have answered a rapid fire range of a lot of different questions with with honesty and grace. And thank you so much for, for entertaining us with for 45 minutes and letting us into your perspective and the ideas of the German government as well. Of course, you as a representative. And I will thank you for speaking with me and I will hand it back over to Ambassador Shapiro. Are we? Are you back with us? How's your Wi-Fi? I, I hope I'm back and my Wi-Fi <laughs> seems to be working. It, it edited me for droning on too long. So I, anyhow, thank, thank you for continuing without me. Um, I, I'm still thinking about the idea of Lukashenko sending the message that we can get you anywhere. I mean, that's a chilling message. And, and actually that's the message that, that Stalin sent when he had Trotsky killed in Mexico, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, wow. Um, I'm gonna end on an up note, Charles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyhow, that's something we all got to think about. This has been an amazingly wide ranging conversation. And, and Ricky, I want to congratulate you. Uh, as a great interviewer and you covered an amazing number of topics in a very short time and Ambassador Haber, you fielded them all. It was like yeah. watch, watching someone play tennis. You were just, you were know, great. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. To, to hang on for just a minute, I gotta do a little self-promotion here. I wanna say to everybody in the audience, uh, please join the World Affairs Council as an individual or a corporate member if you're not. Uh, we've got a membership for, you don't have to live in Atlanta. We've got a digital membership. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll put this up this afternoon, and uh, but you also wanna see our other programs. They're there, it's no charge. It's not like subscription costs you something, but it doesn't. Um, Ricky asked about um, just, discrimination in Germany. We've got a program on Friday, two days from now, at noon Eastern time, uh, where we're gonna look at the ripple effect of Black Lives Matter and the roots of Black protest in Germany. Tiffany Florville, who's an associate professor of history at the University of New Mexico and the author of Mobilizing Black Germany, a book about Afro-German women uh, and the role that Black German women have played in the anti-racism movement at home and across Europe. So it's noon on Friday. This is probably the best audience I know that is the most interested in German issues. So everybody, please subscribe to that. And we'll put, we'll send out the registration link to everybody who is on, on this call. And then next week, June one, two, and three, that's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we've got the Atlanta Summit on Global Health, the race to beat COVID-19. Just gonna tell you, we've got three days, four keynoters, it's an hour and a half each day. We've got a scene setter by Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan, who is the founder of Oxygen for India, where he's gonna talk about the impact of COVID in India. He'll be joining us from New Delhi. And the closing keynote on June 1 is gonna be Dame Sally Davies, who's the United Kingdom special envoy for AMR and also a master of Trinity College, Cambridge, the first female master of Trinity College in its 450 year history. On Wednesday, June 2nd, the keynoter will be Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC. And then on Thursday, June 3rd, the keynoter will be Gail Smith, the US State Department coordinator for global COVID response. So that's gonna be great. Um, please, uh, I urge all of you to uh, 
uh, register for those programs. I want to thank World Affairs Councils around the country who've advertised our program with Ambassador Hubbard to your members and thank your people for, for attending. I want to thank Sebastian Ernst, who is Ambassador Hubbard's chief of staff, who worked all the details out and has been a great help in putting this together. Valerie Lopez de Frank, our producer, Henny Renner, and he, I can even say it, Henna Rennie, our interim program director, and our intern, Josephine Steinberg. Thanks again, Ambassador Emily Haber and Ricky Bevington. This has been great. I, I think the two of you might want to take this on the road. This is a great way of getting Germany's points across to the American public. And I hope your, your public relations people at the embassy will take this YouTube video that we'll send and use it and send it out to, to your network, because this has just been an amazing conversation. Everything from Belarus to, to, to anti-Semitism, to energy, to uh, two, two-way pipelines. So this, this has just been e extraordinary. Thank you all very much. Uh, everybody have a great afternoon, and I hope to see you Friday at noon talking about the impact of Black Lives Matter in Germany. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador Shapiro. Thank you, Ricky Bevington. It was wonderful okay. to see you both. Great.